Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fun Caliber. Today's episode provides a detailed explanation and deep understanding of the intricacies involved in managing a high conviction, concentrated portfolio in a dynamic global market. I'm Chris Sarley, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Zerud Osmani, manager of the elite rated Martin Curry Global Portfolio Trust. Zerud, once again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Let's start with, I mean, you, your portfolio, in in my opinion, is as active as they come. You, you've got 25 to 40 of the best companies. I mean, for a listener wondering essentially how you get from A to B, maybe just give us a bit of insight in terms of what sort of companies you're looking for, how you, you sort of spot those gems in a sort of huge universe of companies. Yeah, it's a good question. So we have a an investment process that's a three-step process. And uh, the way we narrow it down is in the first step, which is uh, screening. Uh, here, what we're doing is we're looking for companies that have high returns on invested capital and an attractive growth profile. We also like companies to have solid balance sheets. So that's another area of assessment. And when we look at uh, return on invested capital, we include good Goodwill, uh, which really means that we like companies that grow organically rather than through acquisitions. If they go have a lot of acquisitions, goodwill will increase. At that point, we'll also assess some of their capital allocation decisions to assess whether they've created or destroyed value as part of that. Uh, and we're able to then filter down to companies that uh, genuinely are able to create value for shareholders. So that's how we then narrow down the universe at that screening stage. We then take that uh, bunch of companies and sit down in what we label research pipeline meetings, which is where we decide which of those companies that are screening favorably across those measures uh, are we going to move to step two. And that is a combination of harnessing our analyst knowledge on the sectors that they cover and therefore their preference for which companies we should work on, as well as our needs at the portfolio level in terms of different areas. Um, and uh, then we move to that step two, the in-depth fundamental research. Uh, which we do iteratively. That's where we then understand all the aspects uh, that we want to assess on the company at the fundamental level. And I'm sure you're going to have questions around that uh, valuation in that uh, step two is critical. And we've got a detailed structured valuation framework with uh, discipline on that front. Uh, at the end of that step two, we have a good sense of upside on any company we've researched, but also a good understanding of the risks that that company brings. And then we there for move to step three, which is the portfolio construction. Portfolio construction for us is capturing the best ideas that come out of our research process mm -hmm. and delivering them in this high conviction, concentrated portfolio that you mentioned of 25 to 40 names, but importantly, with no unintended risk exposures. And I would argue that many stock pickers focus on step one and two, screen for ideas, research them. If you like it, put it into the, the, the fund. Um, but for us, step three is just as important as step one and two because of that aspect of ensuring that we do not have any unintended risks. Okay. Well, let's let's quickly, I mean, there's no time at the present. You, you, you talked about the valuation there. Maybe let's just touch a little bit on what you look for in terms of valuation and maybe just give us an idea of how many companies you sort of go really deep into before building that final portfolio? Yeah, good question. On the latter part of uh, that question, typically we go through uh, 90 plus stocks uh, per annum in terms of in-depth research. That's step two of the process. And um, the valuation framework is uh, based on three tools. Uh, one is discounted cash flow, which accounts for 50% of our price target assessment. The other one is economic value add for 25%. And the last one is... Uh, target multiples. And for that, uh, it's 25%. But instead of using 12 months forward multiples, we use year five multiples. So arguably, uh, also longer term valuation tools. Ultimately, the aim is to put a fair value on the business that we look rather than what the market might be willing to pay over the next 12 months. Uh, we forecast for companies over 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's a long forecast period. 
in order to make sure we capture the full growth potential of any company we research, but also forecast the stage of maturity of those businesses by year 16 onwards. Um, and yes, forecasting is difficult, but we always say that if you're not aiming to forecast, you're having even less potential to understand the shape of growth and returns profile of any business that you're looking at. And then those um, forecasts at the valuation level, we also don't just rely on one set of forecasts, which would be the base case scenario. We run different scenarios. We run a bull case, a bear case, a blue sky, and a dark sky scenario, so that we capture different potential outcomes because of that forecast risk uh, that I mentioned at the start. We ask the analyst to put a probability on each scenario, which means that that gives us additional information about upside downside risk on any company as we look at the valuation. And we'll always aim to uh, favor companies where the skew is to the upside. But it's by having that very detailed assessment, very structured framework that we're able to then have that sense of which companies give us the most interesting upside, which companies have we got the most favorable risk profile, and which companies have we got the strongest conviction in. There's sort of a, you can sort of paint in a picture of sort of this search for sort of quality growth, but also the valuation argument of sort of, you know, you can see the story of the company and how it evolves to a point where perhaps it becomes more mature. Um, but there is another string that I wanted to talk about, which is the mega trends that drive your research. So could you maybe talk about those trends and how they're evolving, please? Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, uh, quality growth because that's how we define the type of companies we invest in. A good balance of high return invested capital for the quality side and a good uh, growth profile typically. Um, so in terms of uh, the thematic lens, we've uh, put in place a framework with uh, three mega trends that we've identified, which are demographic changes, future of technology, and resource scarcity. And if you think about it, Chris, those mega trends are here to stay. In 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time, hopefully we're still talking to each other and still in the industry, we'll still be talking about this. There are themes within those three mega trends, and those themes can evolve over time. But what we do is we list the themes that each mega trend is capturing. When we research a stock, we assess which themes is that company facing on a forward-looking basis and to what extent, which means we can then aggregate the data at the portfolio level, which permits us to achieve three things. Firstly, we know the portfolio exposures more accurately in terms of themes that run through the portfolio and to what extent they run through the portfolio. Secondly, we can manage diversification more efficiently. So we can look at how many themes have we got and are we sufficiently diversified given that we're running typically 30 stock portfolios. And thirdly, it gives us visibility on themes we might not have researched in which case we point the research into those, or if there are themes we want to gain more exposure, again, pointing the research efforts there. But we would only invest in a theme or companies in a theme if they're attractively valued. I always say we don't invest in attractive themes, we invest in attractively valued themes. Mm -hmm. um, but importantly, by this framework, we put our clients' assets, our shareholders' assets on long-term structural growth opportunities, looking ahead into the future rather than looking into the rearview mirror. I mean, you've got those three themes that come to mind, you know, the, the, the future of technology, the, the resource scarcity and, the, and those demographic changes. I, I, I just want to sort of maybe try and sort of bring them to life a bit earlier. So, so yeah. I mean we should talk about some of those underlying companies. I, I wanted to touch on healthcare, which sort of covers a few <laughs> across all of those themes, really. I mean, it makes up a quarter of the portfolio and, you know, people are clearly aging. I think there's like 1.3 billion people are predicted to be sort of 65 or older by 2050. Um, yeah. You tend to favor companies that tie into that sort of theme of future futuristic technology or have more efficient means of delivering care rather than those more traditional sort of pharmaceutical companies. Could you maybe just sort of explain why and, and sort of give an example perhaps? 
Yeah, absolutely. And you're touching on one of our three seismic thematic shifts, as we call it, um, which capture the eight themes that we favor. Um, and so I'll very quickly mention those three seismic thematic shifts. One is energy transition. The other one is aging population, which is the one you're asking about. And the third one is artificial intelligence. Um, and so as we zoom in, maybe we'll go on to energy transition and artificial intelligence later on. But on the aging population, it is about healthcare infrastructure. So your question is well put, Chris. Um, the population is aging. Uh, over 16% of uh, the world population will be 65 years or over by 2050. And sadly, as a result, incidence of diseases will increase with age. Um, we have a theme called the 21st century disease, diseases, sorry, um, which are cancers, obesity, and diabetes, which are prominent lifestyle-related diseases, uh, and sadly, they're comorbidities, so they're linked to each other. Uh, there's estimates that show that uh, incidence of diabetes will increase by 49%. Uh, by 2040. Uh, cancers will increase by 31% over that period. And then um, on the obesity side, so we can mention things like heart failures increasing by 92% or breathing disorders uh, that are somewhat related to obesity increasing by 37%. So a lot of reasons why there will be a significant need to invest more in healthcare infrastructure. And as you observe from our positions, we like to be in companies that uh, are capturing the spending that will go into that uh, healthcare infrastructure. So companies in the medical technology space, uh, it's a significant part of uh, the portfolio. Um, and we've got a combination of companies that do uh, uh, benefit from the uh, drug developments and production uh, and the outsourcing that goes around that. Uh, we've got companies that are exposed to the genomic space, which uh, here touches on the theme of bespoke healthcare, so more targeted therapies as a result of uh, the advances in genome sequencing. Uh, so it's an exciting area, that one. Okay. Um, obviously, your biggest exposure is in the IT space. I mean, it's the largest single sector exposure. Um, maybe just talk us through that as well. I mean, is that heavily linked to AI in terms of your focus on long term trends? Do you, do you sort of have primary and secondary beneficiaries, for example? I, I think we talked before and you mentioned Atlas Copco as an example of a company that, that perhaps is a is a is a sort of secondary beneficiary of that. Maybe just give us a, a run through on that. And, and also the idea that perhaps it's maybe, you know, some of the pessimists would argue it's a bit too early to sort of monetize AI as an investment thing. Could, could we get a bit of insight on that, please? Yeah, sure. So our view is that uh, the market is underestimating the AI opportunity, both in terms of size and in terms of speed at which uh, AI is going to be taken up. Um, four of our eight midterm thematic opportunities uh, capture AI. Uh, the first one is metaverse and quantum computing. And this is about big tech spending on these areas. The second one is robotics and automation, which has been accelerated by that advance of AI. The third one is cloud computing, as cloud providers are racing each other to upgrade their cloud infrastructure to make it AI ready. And related to that, the increased spend in cybersecurity. And the fourth theme that touches on AI is technological and geopolitical fragmentation. Here we're talking about China, we're talking about the um, Taiwan uh, focus and the tensions between China and the US around Taiwan, the fact that the US is uh, uh, limiting uh, access to leading edge semiconductor technology uh, by China. Uh, which creates that uh, technological fragmentation and geopolitical fragmentation. So there's going to be winners and losers from that. Arguably, AI touches on all areas of the economy ultimately. So even our theme of energy transition will benefit from AI. Um, at this stage, the market debate will be about what is the size of the opportunity uh, and how quickly will that opportunity be realized. So our view is it touches all agents of the economy governments, corporates, and households. Mm -hmm. Corporates as are most likely to harness AI faster because AI makes a corporate more productive and or more creative and therefore 
either keeps it competitive or makes it more competitive in what is a never more competitive world. Uh, so harnessing AI will be critical. Um, and uh, we think governments will increasingly be spending more on AI. Uh, NVIDIA calls it the sovereign AI opportunity. It started to come through, but from an early stage. And here it's about national security. It's about defense. And clearly, AI will be able to enhance the ability to deliver on both of those fronts. Uh, there's an interesting uh, report by Goldman Sachs that highlights that AI has the potential to increase global GDP growth by seven percentage points and boost productivity by 1.5 percentage points per annum. So an increase in productivity over a decade of over 15 percentage points. That's staggering. But it also has the potential to displace 300 million jobs worldwide, which is why it's going to impact households, it's going to impact governments from the point of view of needing to put policies in place to uh, uh, retrain uh, workforces. And there's going to be potential uh, shifts and migration in uh, displaced labor, which itself creates its uh, political uh, challenges. Um, but AI will impact not just the services, but also the industrial economies, whether it's manufacturing, construction, transport, autos, agriculture, aerospace, energy. So we are, with AI, living through the start of what we think to be a techno-industrial revolution. Jensen Wang, the CEO of NVIDIA, called it an industrial revolution. We amend that quote by saying it's a techno-industrial revolution that we're on the cusp of living through. And it's going to speed up uh, breakthroughs. I can maybe give you a few anecdotes. Um, there's about 300 million known proteins to mankind. Um, it typically takes a student to whole PhD, so five years, to unfold and map in 3D terms one protein. Uh, Google, through its AlphaFold program using AI, has unfolded all known 300 million proteins uh, in record times and made that data available to humanity. So technically, it saved over 1.5 billion PhD uh, study years um, uh, through that process. And we're already getting uh, uh, proteins being developed that uh, have the potential uh, to make uh, uh, plants uh, disease resistant uh, mm -hmm. using that, uh, that knowledge. We've got some proteins that have been uh, um, developed that eat into plastic waste, which tackles mm -hmm. some of that. And there's so many other examples like that of breakthroughs that have been accelerated, which makes it a very exciting era to be in. As far as uh, Atlas Copco is concerned, Chris, uh, the way we look at it is uh, about a quarter of its business is in vacuum technology. And vacuum technology is used in the semiconductor industry to keep the semiconductor chambers free of any dust. Uh, the bigger the chambers, the more complex uh, vacuum technology you need to use. So uh, that's where Atlas Copco is somewhat exposed to the semiconductor ecosystem. And on the semiconductor ecosystem, uh, we believe that uh, we are facing a super cycle. There's going to be a need for more super uh, semiconductors generally across across devices. Uh, and we are now saying that AI is turbo boosting the semiconductor super cycle. So where we've been forecasting an 8% annualized growth in the semiconductor market to 2038, so over 15 years, we're now increasing that estimate by 2.5 percentage points. So we're now looking at a 10.5% annualized growth in the semiconductor uh, market as a result of that turbocharged AI. Yeah. I, I wanted to follow up on NVIDIA because it's timely, well, it's been timely for a few months, but particularly because it's now the world's largest company. It's also, the, as of speaking, the, the biggest holding in your portfolio, I believe. How does a valuation of a company like that get assessed in your portfolio? Because as we've said, that you know, it is, AI is being monetized, but it's such a huge theme. How, how on earth do you sort of evaluate it, you know, a company like NVIDIA for a, a long-term growth story. 
Yeah, so it's uh, the importance of forecasting over the long term to really capture the potential addressable market that AI brings. And as an aside, uh, even a company like NVIDIA back in uh, March 21 was estimating AI to be an addressable market of $300 billion. Then 12 months later, uh, increased that figure to $1 trillion. And this March has actually started talking about a $2 trillion market potential uh, by the addition of sovereign AI, so government spending on AI, as we mentioned. So it's still going to be an ongoing debate. But for us, the valuation is about we forecast the addressable market, we forecast how much of that NVIDIA can capture uh, through its competitive positioning. Uh, we assess uh, revenues, profits, and cash flows through that 15-year period. We feed that into our valuation framework, and we stay disciplined. Um, and for us, what's exciting when we look at NVIDIA is many aspects. And I went to their uh, headquarters and R&D uh, center, center uh, in March, actually, uh, to get a better sense for the culture that this company is run through and to discuss how they see the, the future. And uh, we think NVIDIA is effectively in a similar position to where ASML was 10 to 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. as a quasi-monopoly facing a super cycle. Mm -hmm. That's the first point to mention. Uh, it's got a significant market share in the GPU space, over 90% share. Uh, it's got scale benefits, which means uh, its R&D spend now in dollar terms outweighs some of its competitors like AMD by two to three times which permits it to not just keep its technological leadership, but actually, in our view, widen the technological gap. And you see that from uh, the fact that they've accelerated their um, innovation cycle from introducing new products every two years to now going to a one-year upgrade cycle. Uh, and what we've seen from this year is that they're actually further consolidating their competitive positioning because uh, they've uh, presented this Black, Blackwell chip, which is combining GPUs, CPUs, um, uh, network uh, components, as well as uh, software, all into one. So they're really providing solutions to the cloud providers. And the cloud providers are actually spending an awful lot uh, of money. So when we're looking at the three cloud providers and Meta in terms of CapEx spend and how much they've increased, uh, we're looking at her 130 billion additional CapEx over the next three years, over and above what they were planning to spend prior to this uh, AI exat excitement. Okay. Uh, I wanted to touch on one more holding quickly before, before we sort of round off here, and that would sure. be perhaps a, well, of one of your longer term holdings in, in MasterCard. That's probably a good example of, of you highlighting the story of what this fund tries to do. Could you, could you maybe just talk us through, you know, just, just briefly on sort of what you what it has achieved and why you expect it to remain so, I guess, more importantly, why you expect it to remain so prominent a holding going forwards? Yeah, so we like the credit card companies generally uh, because they're uh, in uh, an industry that's got favorable dynamics as a uh, uh, oligopoly, uh, and they're capturing effectively transactions uh, globally uh, because they've got these very dominant positions. They're able to achieve uh, scale economies and uh, high returns. So you're looking at uh, companies that uh, are therefore able to grow at a reasonable rate and that are able to uh, achieve high returns. So MasterCard, we're looking at 79% uh, ROIC uh, last year, uh, which we think will go to 153% by year five of our forecast. Uh, and in terms of gross profile, we're looking at a company that should be growing its top line at 14% annualized over the next five years and the earnings at 16% annualized over the next five years. So a lot of reasons that, why that, we like it. I was going to say that that return on investing capital kind of gives you an idea of how not dominant the sort of secure position it has in the market, if, if you catch my, my drift on that without sort of putting the, the mockers on them. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, we should maybe mention the same one. Uh, uh, this is a company that's uh, uh, asset light. So we've got 113% ROIC last year. We're looking at 146% ROIC by uh, by year five. And the gross profile of NVIDIA is exciting. 33% annualized gross on top line, uh, 33% uh, also on earnings over the next five years. All the uh, aspects that really make this uh, uh, an attractive algorithm algorithm of high growth, high returns. And what I should have mentioned on NVIDIA as well is we like companies that can monetize the AI spend. And uh, what NVIDIA has shown is uh, that it is indeed able to monetize. So when you look at uh, the share price performance, yes, it's been very strong, but it's actually barely kept up over the last 12 months with the sales revision. And actually mm -hmm. earnings revisions have been significantly more uh, than the share price move, uh, which uh, maybe highlights, Chris, a uh, point we want to highlight, which is in AI, what you have to watch out for is a potential risk of froth. Uh, so yeah. we we track a basket of over 50 AI stocks globally. Uh, over the last 12 months, uh, the share price on average has gone up 44%. We've taken NVIDIA out of that because uh, its share price went up by over 200%. So we didn't want to skew that average. So 44% increase in price on average for that basket of 4 by 50 stock. But the sales estimates have not moved. Okay. And the earnings estimates have only moved up by 7%. So we believe that at some point over the next couple of years, if these companies do not show the market that they can monetize our AI opportunity, you could have a, an element of uh, uh, realization that not all companies are well positioned to harness AI. Okay, that's very interesting. I, I want to just quickly finish with a sort of a minute on the economy. Um, it seems like, well, rate rises already started in Europe, but they seem to be eminent everywhere else too. Um, yeah. Does that play any impact whatsoever on your portfolio, given that quality growth focus? Or, or are you looking at it as an opportunity given the the underlying companies you invest in? Well, uh, our companies are long duration companies in terms of cash flow generation, compound and characteristics, high returns. So they tend to have an element of sensitivity to rates in the similar way to bond-like uh, characteristics. So um, as we're heading into central banks uh, starting to go into easing mode and interest rate cuts, we believe that should be favorable for the quality growth type of companies for those rate sensitivities. Um, the aspects we've been highlighting at the back end of last year, though, has been we're of the view that inflation will be steadier and longer lasting. And that's now coming to be a realization by the market. Uh, that feeds into our view that central banks for us were not going to pivot towards cuts until the second half of this year, which is more or less what's happening. Um, it's pleasing to see that the market has now adjusted its expectations. It was probably a bit too bullish uh, on that front. But it's got to be said, Chris, uh, it's an interesting period because central banks uh, have started to cut uh, and the Fed that's signaling a cut in H2 are really talking about hawkish cuts. And that's quite unusual. It's effectively saying we're cutting, but actually we're not going to cut anymore. So a hawkish cut is maybe a realization by central banks that inflation is indeed stickier and they might not be able to do much cutting, if at all. But perhaps they're doing one cut just to uh, give to the market what they had signaled uh, towards back end of last year in order to not be disappointed. Net okay. net, we would say as long term investors, Heading into a period where rates might get cut should be supportive, but keep an eye on wage inflation because that's the biggest contributor to inflationary pressures. And we think wage inflation still remains elevated in the US, in the UK, and in Europe. Uh, hence, our view that inflation will be stickier. And what we wrote last year, Chris, uh, on the back of uh, Jackson, uh, the Jackson Hole Symposium, is that central banks have gone into a data dependency mode now. So any inflation print will be something that they'll look in order to determine their next interest uh, move. And therefore, the market will be somewhat more volatile because the market with every inflation print will be 
speculating as to whether this means the central banks are going to be on hold or whether they're going to cut. So on that note, that very cheerful note, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining us once again. Thank you very much, Chris. It's been uh, great to talk to you. This is a high conviction, unconstrained portfolio of 25 to 40 companies from across the globe, with the top 10 accounting for more than 50% of the overall portfolio. The trust has a strong focus on quality growth businesses that the team believe are leaders and innovators across long-term investment themes, such as the future of technology, resource scarcity, and demographic changes. To learn more about the Martin Curry Global Portfolio Trust, please visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Calibre's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Calibre's research team only. Mm -hmm.